And Amelia, take it away. Okay, I'm just tapping my screen. So hi, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again for another watercolor snacks class. Um, introducing myself again, just in case you haven't met me before. My name is Amelia Gossman. I'm an artist living in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, I'm also an art teacher. Um, so I am going to be teaching a um, color theory class this coming spring semester um, at a community college and hopefully teaching illustration again this coming spring um, at Towson University, which is where I also work in the library. Um, so I'm really excited to be teaching another class for watercolor snacks. Um, and we're going to be working on a really cute um, badger who's reading a book. So let's go ahead and get started with that. So we can switch over to the other screen here. Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to clear my screen really quick. I got the message that we're recording. Um, great. So I'm going to quickly kind of just review what came in the watercolor snacks box for fall 2023, um, because that's what I'm going to be using for this um, painting today. Um, and I was thinking that um, if you're like me, um, once you get art supplies, they kind of go all over the place um because I have various places where I store my art supplies so just really quickly um the paper that I'm going to be working on is the agave watercolor paper from Hannah Mule um so this again this is a watercolor paper that comes on a block so it's all attached together with glue binding. So you would want to use either an X-Acto knife or a palette knife or something flat that you can get in there to separate them out. I cut my paper into a little less than half. So I'm going to be working small, um, but you're welcome to work any size that you like. Um, but I like to work a little bit smaller um, just so that I have a little, uh, it doesn't take quite as much time. To, to complete the painting. Um, I'm using the core watercolor uh, pans. Um, and these are the colors in the palette. Um, we have cobalt blue, uh, nickel azo yellow, Payne's gray, the um, phthalo blue, or no, I'm sorry, this is the phthalo turquoise, um, transparent brown oxide and ultramarine violet. So they're not all in order um, that I read them, but these are the colors uh, that we have we'll be working with. I'm going to be mixing some colors as well. Um, there was a collapsible water cup that came in the set. So I have this full of water and I also have an additional mug of water um, so that I can use one for um, adding water to my paints and mixing the colors, and then one that I can use to clean off my brush. So if you have your two cups, just decide which is which <laughs> so that you don't accidentally um, mix up your water. I've done that a couple times. Um, uh, these did not come in the box, but I grabbed them because they're handy. Um, but they're not required if you don't want to use them and if you don't have them, no pressure. Uh, but I did grab a roll of washi tape so that I could have nice crisp edges on my paintings. Um, and then I also will be using, this is a kneaded eraser. Um, if you don't have one and you wanna pick one up, I do believe there are some in the art snack shop. Um, so you can, you can grab one there, but I'll show you how I use these um, when we start our drawing. And then I have, the two brushes that came in the box. I will not be using it for the demonstration, but I did do my uh, preliminary drawing using the Krita Color Fine Art Graphite Pencil. So you can use that if you're working on the drawing stage. If not, no worries. Um, and then I'm not sure if I will use this, but I want to have it handy. This is the Sennelier ink brush. I might want to use the brown or just go over and add some line work. Um, so it's just handy to have, but I don't know if I will end up using it. But you can use it if you like. And then one more thing that I did grab. Now, I didn't mention this in the um, the the post earlier for class prep, but no pressure if you don't have one, you can always grab one later. But I did grab a fine liner to go over some of the line work and um, add some details later. But again, if you don't have one um, or if you don't have one handy, don't worry about it. You can always grab one later or just skip that part. 
Um, and then lastly, I have um, a couple extra things. Again, they didn't come in the box, uh, but I have a palette you can use. If you don't have a palette like this, there is one that is in the lid of the box. And I have scrap paper. I already started testing some colors, but this is what I why I usually have a piece of scrap watercolor handy so I can make sure I like the color that I mix. And then I always have a paper towel so I can dry off my brushes or if I have to dab my painting, um, I can use that. Okay, so now I'm just gonna rearrange a little bit and get everything in its place. Um, I will usually kind of sit my water cup um, that I'm using to clean my brushes on top of my paper towel so that whenever I go in and brush or, or wash my brush or dip it in the water, I can immediately go and dry it off or I can sit it on the paper towel so I'm not leaving it in the cup. So if you see me do that, that's usually how I get started with that. Actually, I try to also arrange things so that um, I'm not moving my hand across my painting. So if I'm dipping my brush in water and then putting it in the palette, I try not to have to cross over my paper. I learned that the hard way <laughs> from dripping things on my painting over the years. Um, so I transferred the drawing that I did. I did a digital drawing um, because I like having the bold lines. And usually I'll do a sketch um, separately and then I'll transfer it onto my watercolor paper um, because I want to have clean lines. That's one reason. Um, so I had my uh, drawing, I printed it out and then used a light table to transfer, transfer it. But if you don't have a light table, you could also take a graphite pencil and just rub across the back. Let me show you, I'm actually putting graphite on the paper. You would want to rub the graphite on the back. Usually a heavier, greasier pencil will work better, but whatever you have usually works. And you want to cover the whole thing and then you would lay it on top of the paper and use usually a ballpoint pen and trace it on that way. And you just trace over the whole thing. And it will usually transfer. So if you don't want to cut the paper off of your block, you can do it that way. But I used a light table for this. Um, and then, so that that's one reason I like to be able to have clean lines without any sketch marks um, or major erasures on the paper. So that doesn't um, wear down the paper as much. The other reason is I actually trace this three times. I have three different versions. So something that I appreciate is if I ever find that I've made a major mistake that I can't really quite pull back from or correct, uh, or if I want to do more than one version or try it again with different colors, you can kind of endlessly copy your original sketch. You can also use it as a reference in case you lose some of your line work. So those are just some tips for preparing your actual drawing. Um, so once I get it to this stage where I have my pencil drawing on the paper, this is an optional step for you. It depends on how much of the pencil work you want to show through. But I like to take the kneaded eraser and I will I almost kind of create a little handle like this where I am pinching it. And then I will kind of rock the eraser over the line work. And I'll do a little section here so I can show you. But you can see the difference with how this area is so much lighter than this area. Um, because once you put uh, watercolor down on your paper, it's going to seal the graphite onto the paper. So you won't be able to erase it, at least not very easily. So I found that by lightening it up a little bit before I add the paint to it, if there are any other corrections or if there's an area that I want to be very, very light and kind of fade away, then it's a little easier to do um, before I put the watercolor onto the paper. So that's just my preference. But if you don't mind having the graphite on there and you don't want to erase it, you would rather have the line work a little darker and easier to see, that's perfectly fine. You'll find your own method that works best for you. Um, interestingly, when I was a kid, I uh, got an, a copy of the book, East of the Sun, West of the Moon, and it's illustrated by Mercer Meyer. 
um, who did the little critter books, if you're familiar with those. Um, and in the back of that book, there's a little, I guess, blurb or just a short paragraph about his um, process for how he made the book. And I was really fascinated because he mentions that he does this. So for his watercolor paintings, he will do a pencil drawing on whatever paper he's working on. And then we'll go in and lighten it up. I, I think it said like 40% or something like that. Um, and then we'll add the color on top. And it was so interesting. I was like, how does he do that? And then of course, I figured it out later that you can do that using a kneaded eraser because it will sort of pull some of the graphite off the paper without fully erasing it like a rubber or plastic eraser would. So I was like, oh, so that's the key. So that's why I do it with my work too, um, because for the other reasons I mentioned, but I also thought that, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's pretty cool. Mercer Meyer does it that way. So that's a pretty cool thing that I learned um, just from reading the book. So I'm going to start this painting like I did the last one by putting a wash of color onto the paper. So I'm going to take some of the water that's in my cup I'll move it down a little so you can see more. I take a little bit of this water and I'm going to put it into one of my palette wells just so that I have some water to start with and so that it starts to dilute the color a little um, right at the start so that I don't have really thick um, heavy pigment on the paper. I want it to be a really light wash. You can choose if you want to put water on first, if you like having the paint spread a little bit more, um, but just know it's going to take a little longer to dry. I'm just going to go ahead and do wet onto dry paper for this time. So I'm going to grab some of this, um, of the, which one is this? This is the transparent brown oxide. And I'm going to make just kind of a light wash of this color. And I'm using the angle brush, the bigger one, because that's going to cover more surface area of the paper. If you use the little tiny brush, you will be on that step forever. <laughs> so um, it helps to um, use a bigger brush for, bi for bigger areas and then save the detail brush for details. So I'm actually going to, I think I'm going to turn this this way. This is a technique I learned in a watercolor class that I took when I was a student at um, the Maryland Institute College of Art, which we just call MICA for, for short because it's a really long name. Um, but I learned this technique that you wanna pick a direction and then very slowly pull the color down. And that will help you get a nice even layer of watercolor because it can, um, it can come out kind of streaky. But just take your time with this step. And I kind of cross over my previous brush stroke when I do this so that I'm getting the color to be a little more even and flowing into each other. And it'll have, it'll be less likely that it will have any super sharp defined edges. But my professor told me to, well, not just me, the whole class, <laughs> taught us to pull almost like a bead of paint that kind of settles down at the bottom to pull that all the way across and to continue it down into the next layer. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. You can see that I'm doing that with each pass. And if you feel like you have too much paint, you can kind of go over it and soften it out a little bit with your brush. And the trick I think is mostly just keeping it all in the same direction. So if you're going from left to right, 
then you're going to want to do that for the entire painting. You don't want to, I mean, you can, you can do whatever you want, but you will have a more even um, layer of color if you continue in the same direction. Whereas if you kind of go all over in different directions, that will come through in your painting. So if you want it to look nice and smooth and even, that's that's a good trick for doing that. So I'm gonna let this dry a little bit because I want this wash to be totally dry. So take a moment just to kind of let it sit a little bit before moving on to the next stage. But I'm gonna go ahead and move forward while this one dries. And I'll go back and forth between my two paintings so that as one dries, I can pick up the next one. So we're gonna set this one aside. And I have one that's already dry where I added, this one's a little bit of a lighter wash, but um, you know, it still kind of has the same effect where we're starting with a color underneath so that there's not any pure white of the paper. Um, for I don't have any super bright highlights in this painting. Usually you'd want to kind of reserve the white of the paper for your brightest highlights, uh, but I don't have anything super bright white in this painting, so that's why I added a wash of color across the whole piece. And then I'm going to build up more layers after that. So the next step that I did for this painting was grabbing water from my clean water cup. I'm going to work on the lamp here. So I'm going to add, this is going to be wet on wet. So I'm painting the lampshade. I'm filling in the lampshade with just clean, clean water. And then getting some of the excess water off my brush. And I'm going to soften out the edges. I know it's a little hard to see because it's just clear. But I'm softening out the edges a little bit with my brush so that it's I'm kind of covering that area that's glowing. The wettest part is going to be in the middle here. And then I'm going to take some of the nickel azo yellow and I'm just going to put a little bit of that in my palette. And I'm just doing maybe a couple swipes over the top. I don't need a super duper saturated yellow, but I do want it to be kind of intense. And I'm going to pick up some of the paint with the tip of the angle here, and I'm going to put some of that in the middle. And I'm kind of just, this is where the light bulb would be in the middle of the lampshade. And I'm kind of going in a circular motion to feather out that color a little bit. And then because I want the edges to be soft, right now they're a little bit harsh. Rinse off my brush and grab a little clean water. And so now I don't have any paint on my brush, just water. And I'm going to dab a little bit of that off and I will I'm going to pull the color out and feather it out. I'm going to be using this technique a couple of times, um, but if you want me to do a little bit more of a close up demonstration, let me know. I'm happy to do it. But this technique is really helpful if you want soft edges and you want to feather out some of the paint so that you don't have a harsh edge, but you don't want to do a really wet on wet wash. This can be really helpful. So I'll be using this to create some gradient shadows in other areas of the painting as well. So you'll get kind of a glowing effect like that. Let me pull this up a little closer. So hopefully you can see where it's the most bright and intense. It's going to soften out and get a little less bright. I'll do that again on this on this painting here so you can see it again. This one's still a little bit damp, so I might pick up some of that wash in the background. So if that's if your piece is still a little bit wet, just be aware you might pick it up a little, but that's okay because 
this is meant to be a really bright area. So it won't do any harm if you pull up some of that color. I'm just going to open up the chat really quick. Okay. So again, turning my brush so that the sharper point is picking up most of the pigment, but a little bit in the middle. And actually, I think I need a little more. So if you feel like you don't have quite enough paint, you can just pull a little more into your palette. And I'm kind of creating a circle by almost drawing a spiral with the paint like this. Right off. So, I'd, and the reason I'm drying off my brush in between cleaning it off and putting it into the uh, clear paint water cup is because I don't want to cross contaminate. I'm trying to keep this as clear as possible. So, you see me do that in between. That's the reason why. Again, I'm just going to feather. Like that and you can even if you want to pull so, some of that more intense color where it's wet you can do that now we kind of have that glowing effect coming from the lamp I'm trying to create a really very warm cozy atmosphere for our badger friend so I'll let this one dry and then move on to the next step. So I'm going to set aside my angle brush for now, and I'm going to move on to the detail brush, which is the Princeton round. So I'm going to grab some clean water so that my brush is wet and pick up a little bit of this yellow. So now what I'm going to do is because we have the glow from the lamp, there's going to be some of that light that will be reflected on some of the edges that are closest. So I'm going to add just a little bit of what's called rim lighting. So it's like the, the edge of certain areas. So anything that's kind of sticking out that would, would have a highlight on it, instead of using white, I'm going to use this yellow color like that. And before it dries, I'm going to do the same thing I did with the lamp because I, I want it to be a little bit soft. So I'm going to grab clean water and just soften the edges like this. And you don't want it to be too watery, just enough to start to pick up the, the paint a little bit and feather it out. If you feel like the color is too intense, uh, you can always grab a little piece of paper towel or rip a little piece of paper towel off and just dab your paper like this. And that will lighten it up a little bit too. I know this is very light still, so if you need me to hold it up a little closer, um, just let me know. I'll be happy to show some details if that's needed. But I'm going to, going to get the edge of the armchair here, his leg and the top of his shoe, a little bit of the leg of the chair and then the top of his shoe there. And then I'm gonna, again, get some clean water and just soften that edge out a little. Kind of scrubbing the paper a little bit almost with the brush. So using sort of circular motion.
Okay, so I'm going to hold this up a little bit so you can see it in a little more detail here. But you can see, so we have our light source, and then we have some highlights where it's going to get the most light. So it looks like it's glowing. And we're going to be adding more color to this and sort of mixing in more layers. So it won't be quite as intensely yellow once we add more of the color to it, uh, but it will sort of look like it's being touched by the glow of the light. And he has a really nice warm colored lamp in his little den. Okay. Do that on the piece while that dries a little bit. And I can show you again. We'll go a little more quickly this time. Hey, Emilio, Sarah, jumping in here real quick. Sure. You are about 30 minutes into class. Great. Thank you. Looks awesome. I love this glowing technique. Thanks. Great. Yeah. I. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's very cool. It's something like I would have, wouldn't have really thought of when doing like an illuminated piece. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, um, I really like things that are kind of atmospheric and warm. So I thought it might be fun, especially it's getting cold around where I live. Although in Maryland, some days it's sunny and 70. And then the next day it's 40 and rainy and cloudy. So we have pretty uh, picky weather, <laughs> but I am personally in a very cozy state of mind. I'm, I'm ready to be bundled up for the holidays. So that's just me. I was thinking about cozy creatures. Okay, so I'll show you. I have one that's a little bit more finished. It doesn't quite have the line work on it yet, but I went through and filled in a lot of the spaces with different colors to create a really nice, uh, rich, cozy palette. So I'm going to show you the process of how I mixed the colors, but you're welcome to deviate from this palette if you would like. So don't feel pressured to make the the colors anything in particular. If you're feeling you want something more bold, uh, if you want to have a bright blue chair um, and you know a, a bright purple book, you're more than welcome. If you want to do a cooler palette, that's great. Um, but I'm going to be mixing these colors and I'm going to walk you through the steps. So you'll see me kind of going in and, and filling in some different areas uh, for the next stage of the painting. So I actually, even though a lot of these spaces are kind of small, I actually used my angle brush to fill in some of the bigger areas. As I mentioned, um, it's easier to fill in bigger space with a bigger brush. Um, so I'm going to be doing that. But if you feel like you're having a hard time controlling the bigger brush and you feel more comfortable just using a smaller one, you can use the smaller one too. So that's totally fine. But I used for the, the color of the chair, I have this kind of the warm uh, brown color. So I just mixed up kind of, a, this is the same one that I used for the wash, just the kind of watered down mix of this where you know I added the water first and then added a couple swipes from the pan into this. So I'm just going to go in. And again, you can use the tip of the brush to get some of the more detailed parts. And we're starting just with a light wash of color first. We'll build up darker colors as we go. So try to keep it kind of light for the first pass. That's the thing with working with watercolors, you're you're always building up layers. So you don't necessarily have to go really, really intensely colored or really dark right away, especially if you are going over 
a darker area with a lighter color, sometimes it will get picked up and it can smudge. So that's another reason why it's good to work from light to dark with watercolor, which is typically opposite of how you might work with other media. So watercolor is pretty special in that way. I have that layer done. And since you're filling in areas kind of one by one, what I like to do is I try not to work to next to spots that are wet um, as much as I can, just so that that way they don't accidentally uh, bleed into each other and kind of create paint blooms that I wasn't intending to happen. So I know it's a little hard because it's surrounding the whole piece. <laughs> So if you want to wait for it to dry, that's fine. Um, but I think I'm going to go ahead and work on the book next. And for this, I'm going to grab some of this yellow. It's really bright yellow color here. And I'm going to mix just a little bit of the brown in to tone it down. I went a little too far. <laughs> that happens with color mixing sometimes. You might go a little bit further in one direction than the other than you meant to. You can always add water also if your color is a little too intense. So I'm gonna add just a little water to that. And I'm gonna swatch it just to make sure I like it before I put it down on the paper. I think that looks good. I was going for kind of a a golden, like a deep golden color. Not so much a bright lemony yellow for this book. So I think that will look good. And since this is a smaller um, area to paint, I'm just going to use my detail brush for this. Okay, so now we have a nice, bright, yellow, cheery book. And I also gave him some socks. So I thought that he would be wearing some nice, cozy socks. So I used that color for the socks as well. And where there's an area with a highlight, what I do is I kind of paint around where the highlight is. And I'll do this up a little closer so you can see since it's so small. Before it dries, I take clear water and then I'm just going to soften it just a little. So you see how because I had darker paint over here, it looks like it's a little more in shadow. And then it looks like that's getting a little bit more light on it. So that's how I do that for those spots. And you might wanna just uh, manipulate it a little bit with your brush. And it looks like it got a little bit too light in one spot. So just add a little more paint where you want it to be darker. And because you're kind of using a wet in wet, you're gonna get a really nice soft edge. So that's kind of the trick to working between using wet on wet versus wet on dry depends on how crisp you want your edges to be. So there's a time to use both, I think.
All right, so as this has dried a little bit, now I'm going to paint the pants. This is fun because I'm gonna mix up a really nice green color. So I'll take some of my water, just that I have some to start with, to wet, wet down the paints a little bit. And I'm gonna grab more of my yellow. Just a couple, grab a couple swipes of that. Clean it up. Dab off the dirty water so now I can grab some clean water and grab a little bit of the cobalt blue. And this is always so fun. I love color mixing because it's like magic. I love just seeing the colors change. So since I added a little more blue, it's a little bit too much on the cool side. I just wanna grab a tiny bit more water because I'm going for a warm palette. So even though um, green is kind of hovering between warm and cool, I want it to be a little bit more yellow coming through. So I'm using my bigger brush because there's a little, just a little bit more area to cover here. And I'll use that nice angle tip to get into those detailed spots. So I, I typically, when using an angle brush like this, try to keep the flat edge against flat edges of the painting, meaning I want to use the shape of the brush to match the shape of what I'm painting. So I kind of paint into the edges. If, hopefully that makes sense. Or you can see that that's what I'm doing here. All right, so before this dries, I'm going to once again use the technique of pulling the paint into the highlight. And this is going to get another layer um, eventually because I want it to be a little bit darker and more intense. But for now, still want to maintain that highlight area there. Okay. Okay, some lovely green pants for our friend here. Okay, so the next color that I'm going to mix is the dark brown of the chair. So we have this really lovely uh, transparent brown oxide color, and I am going to go ahead and start another palette with that color in it, another palette well. And I'm going to grab some of that to start with. So it's going to be kind of the base of the color I'm about to mix. And I grabbed a good amount to create a nice rich color mixture with that. And then I'm going to wash off my brush. And now I'm going to grab some of this Payne's Gray. And this color, which I'll show you, I'm going to swatch a little so you can see it on the paper, that this is kind of a cool gray color, but it's also very dark. So for two reasons, this is going to work well mixing with this color. One, because it's a darker color, it's just going to bring the overall value of the color down. But also, uh, because it's a cool color, we have this kind of warm orangey red color 
When you mix it with the blue, it's going to start to neutralize it and bring down some of the intensity and warmth. Um, and typically when you're when you're mixing colors, um, a good way to get like a nice gray or really dark brown, almost black color is to mix um, a warm and a cool, like a warm brown with a cool blue or gray. So now you can see I have this really lovely dark brown color, which is what I want to use for the outside edge of the chair. So that's how I got this nice dark color here. So I'm just going to go ahead and fill in. I'm starting with the darker side. And I'm using my detail brush for this just because this is very, has some very small detailed areas. If the pants are still wet, just take care not to um, get too close. And I'm going kind of quickly, but take your time with this. Don't feel like you have to rush through this stage, especially if you're just kind of finding your footing with using a really detailed brush, because it can, it takes a lot of practice and it takes time to feel comfortable um, with getting some really detailed brush strokes in there. So this type of watercolor painting that I'm doing is one that's a little bit more focused on sort of filling in the colors, almost like a coloring book. This is a technique that I like to use, but there are lots of different ways that you can use watercolors. So I personally really like to do my drawings first and then fill in the, the areas, but you can use all kinds of different watercolor techniques when doing this as well. So you can see I'm using wet and wet. Um, I'm using some blending techniques, but I like having the really nice sort of, well, honestly, I like to have the balance between choosing really soft um, blended out edges and really sharp defined areas. So I think watercolor is really nice uh, when you're doing illustrations like this for that reason. And it's a great way to fill in a base color. Um, and sometimes what I like to do with my watercolor paintings like this is after it's all dried, I like to take colored pencils and go over and add some details or textures with colored pencils too. But you could also, like we're going to do later, add in some line work with a pen to define, or you can use a small detail brush like this, like we did with the raccoon painting. You can add some line and detail with that as well. So it's pretty cool. Very fun way to do an illustration. But when I was a kid, I learned how to draw first. So I tend to start my paintings as drawings, but you don't always have to do that. I do remember the first time that I ever tried using watercolor. I didn't realize it was watercolor because it was the kind that came in a tube. I guess maybe it wasn't the first time I ever encountered watercolor, but it was the first time I encountered watercolor in a tube. Uh, my friend and I were playing with it and we were like, wow, this paint's really thick. And it's so funny to think back about that. And we were taking just watercolor paints straight out of the tube and trying to paint with them. And it was really difficult to do. So it's just really funny to think about, you know, just the different stages of working with material and learning how they work and all the the trials of figuring that stuff out uh, it's just funny to think I was like oh you have to add water to this <laughs> that makes sense that makes it a lot easier to work with but I'm sure other people have done the same thing 
especially if they're trying out something brand new. So for these areas of the chair, doing the same thing, where taking my damp brush and just sort of dragging out the, the color. And you can also go over that highlight a little bit and that's gonna mix the yellow in with that brown. So it's not quite so sharp of a transition. It sort of fades and blends a little more. And what you're doing is creating what's called a glaze. So when you do a thin wash of color over another uh, wash of color, it's called a glaze. And you can do that with oil paints too and other paints. So it's a, a technique that carries across multiple media. You can do it with watercolor too. Okay. So now that I have this at this stage, I think I'm going to go ahead and move on to filling in the sweater and then I'll do the table and then I'll do the vest. I think we'll do that. And then we'll wrap up with the darkest colors. Um, we'll do a couple more layers on top of that though. So I gave him kind of a grayish color sweater. So I'm gonna take some of my clean water and I'm gonna take a little Payne's gray. And I warmed this up a little bit because it's a little too cool and dark for I think the rest of the palette. So I'm gonna take just a tiny bit of the brown. Now we're doing kind of the opposite where I want it to be darker, more on the darker brown, or sorry, the darker gray side. I also took just a little bit of the violet and I feel like you have to really kind of pick this up. This one's a little bit of a, a more transparent color. So I found I need a little more of that. And I mixed that in as well to create sort of a warm purpley grayish color. So I'm gonna swatch it out for you so you can see. So that's the, the gray that I mixed versus the gray that comes out of the pan. So see how it's a, just a little bit warmer, but it's still gray. So you can always sort of just warm it up just a little bit, or you can change it just slightly enough so that the colors are doing what you want them to for the painting. So you're not always, um, you don't always have to use what comes straight out of the pan. You can always make it work for you. But a good rule of thumb is anytime you want to shift a color just a little bit, look for its opposite on the color wheel. And then depending on how much you add, that will usually get you the effect that you're looking for. I just think it's so amazing how colors can change through mixing because this gray is so different than the Payne's gray that comes out of the pan. It's a really nice color. Okay, and then I'm gonna use the same color here. I'm gonna take a little bit of that and I'm gonna add just a little hint of a shadow underneath since I already have this color mixed. Maybe a little too intense. I'm gonna just dab that off a little. I think I need just a little less. And so I'm adding just a little bit of shadow so that we get the sense that our character is sitting on the ground and not just kind of floating in space. This is a really simple technique for if you're adding something that doesn't have a defined background, it's a really simple way to make it look like it's sitting on something and is has weight to it. So it's a, a good go-to trick that I like to do. Okay, 
So next I'm gonna fill in, let's see, let's do another wash of the, the chair. So that's this color here, the brown. I'm just adding a little more. And I am actually gonna add to this, this green that we mixed up. And I'm just gonna grab a little bit of this and put that in. And what that's gonna do is neutralize it just a little bit. A bit more. That's already shifted that color just a bit. And then I'm going to add just a very small touch of the Payne's Gray. That's a little darker than I meant it to be. So I'm going to add more of this. Sometimes I feel like a scientist or something when I'm adding color. It's like just finding the perfect amount of what to add to get that that perfect mixture but it's really it's all trial and error when it comes to color mixing so you can always sort of push and pull the colors however you want all right so now i'm, I'm painting the the cushion part of the chair and i'm going in and making it darker where there are going to be shadows so this is the part that's getting less light. It's a little more comfortable for my hand to rest. I'm going to add just a little more brown. This feels a little too cool. That's a little better. I tend to, when I'm filling in um, a, a certain shape or space, I found that I tend to go along the edges first and sort of just define where I want to contain the paint. Sort of like this. And then I kind of fill in the middle from there. I think that's something I do kind of intuitively, but the reason for that, I think, is because I'm trying to, I guess, define the boundary of where I want the color to go. Maybe that's something that I just kind of learned from doing digital art, uh, because if you've ever done a digital drawing and then tried to use the bucket tool, you think that the lines are totally connected and they're not the whole thing gets filled with a color so maybe that's sort of a translation there but either way it's something I've kind of observed about myself with how I fill in paint but whatever works best for you is how you should do it but if that works for you give it a try Since this is sort of moving up to a lighter area, I'm going to use a little less paint and just do this a little less intensely. I'll use my technique here. I'm 
I missed the spot. It's, you can fill that in when it's dry. So for this part, I'm actually going to not fill in the glasses because I want it to be a little bit lighter. So I'm gonna paint around the glasses here. I think that will kind of help give the appearance of being transparent while still defining the shape of the glasses. Do I have my paper towel right next to the um, the cups of water? It just makes it so much easier to dab off my brush. And I also kind of, um, whenever I get water from my cup, I kind of run it along the edges and that gets some of the bigger drips of water off of the brush so that it, it doesn't um, cause too much of a puddle on my paper. I'm just building up that color because I'm trying to maintain that highlight on the edge. Yeah. There we go. All right, we'll do another layer over here with this color on the edge of the chair. I'm gonna get a little more intense with it on this side because I want it to be dark. Hey, Amelia, it's Sarah popping in here. Mm -hmm. You've got a half hour left. Great, thank and you. Again, it's looking great. I love I love the addition of the the contrasting colors. So like that dark brown really starts it to make it pop and look like a armchair. You know what I mean? Thanks. Yeah, I feel like once you start adding in the the um, contrasting colors and values is when it really starts to come to life. It's pretty exciting. Okay. And don't forget to think about sort of the position of the different parts of the object. So in the back, it's going to be maybe a little bit more in shadow where there's less light reaching. So it might be a little darker back there. So I'm going to... I'll do that part last because I might even add a little bit of the Payne's Gray to darken it up a little more. But before I add that, I'm going to use up what I've already mixed. All right, yeah, I'm going to add a little bit of the Payne's Gray to my already dark brown mixture to make it just a little bit darker because I want to put the put a lot of definition into the ones that are kind of pushed further back and make those just a little darker. Mm 
significant. Yeah, I think that's good. See how they kind of get pushed further back because they look like they're in the distance because there's less light back there. So I chose to leave the shirt this kind of light brown color. You can fill it in with something if you like, but I just kind of left it because I was thinking I had like a nice crisp white dress shirt underneath of everything else, but you are welcome to color whatever you feel suits your creature. And then I'm using some of the same brown from the chair on the, the side table here. And I'll just do the same thing with, in regard to the shadow, with the darker brown. I'll just add a little shadow. And I'm, I'm just letting it sort of blend into each other this time. A little bit of wet on wet. Right, I missed a spot over here on the armchair. And then there we go. Okay. One last little thing, and then I'm going to start to add the darkest colors on here. So let's go ahead and, well, I do want to also give him more intensely green pants. So we'll do that. Actually, let's do that next. So I'm going to take my green and I'm going to add just a little of the Payne's gray to darken it up. I went too far. So I'll add a little more yellow, just a touch. Feel a little too cool. Let's add some of this. Okay, just check it. Yeah, that looks good. All right, switch back to my angle brush for this. And I'm just gonna go over the pants again, focusing on where the shadows are gonna go first. And then I can, um, soften out my highlights. So he has kind of, he's sitting with his legs crossed. So I want to try to leave the knee highlighted because that's sticking out more and it's going to be catching more light. There we go. So we get a nice gradient on there. And I'm kind of following the shape of the form. So you'll notice I'm kind of using brush strokes around the roundness of his leg. And that's um, a good technique for if you're trying to define a certain form, you don't want something to look too flat. Um, it can help to follow the shape of the form. Because your brush strokes are typically pretty smooth with watercolor, but they can still show through at times. And so it can be helpful to follow the form with your brush stroke to help define that. All right, now this side is gonna be a little brighter, so I don't wanna define it as much. It's not gonna be in as, as much shadow. So I'm going to kind of just define a little bit where it will be darker.
And if you find that you're not able to get enough color when you use the technique of pulling the darker or more intense colored paint into lighter areas, you can just add a little bit more. And because it's wet and wet, it will spread and feather really nicely. And then you can go in and sort of pick up some of the extra with a, a dry, not super dry, but mostly dry brush too. So I'll hold it up since it's a little far, but you can see uh, where I'm starting to get definition just from where I put in light and dark. Okay, and let's just give him, I'm gonna use this yellow that I've already mixed up. Actually, that's the color of the book. Hold on, I try to try not to have the same color next to each other. So let's give him, let me add a little bit of this brown to the yellow, just to make it a little more orange. And then we'll fill that in. Okay. All right, so now mostly filled in, I'm going to go for adding the darker colors in his face. I also made his shoes dark and his hands. And then that should be good for that part. And then we can go over to the dry version and add in some line work if you want to do so. I'm going to add some to mine. I decided I wanted to use a pen because it's just so small that I didn't feel confident in my ability to get the um, the details with just the brush. So I'm grabbing some Haynes Gray. I'm kind of reviving this mix. So Haynes Gray that I'm going to warm up with the brown. This. So I'm really kind of just making a very dark brown and just add a little purple. I'm gonna test it. Okay, I think that looks good. So I think on an actual badger, the lines over his eyes are the dark part, but I chose to change it because I thought it would look a little more clear to see the definition of his face if I went on the middle. So that's what I'm going to do. So it might not be totally accurate to an actual badger, but I think that it'll be okay. <laughs> And I'm kind of using really careful, small brush strokes to fill in this area, just because it's an area with a lot of detail. And I want to try to have a little more control here than I might in other spots. And I am avoiding the nose for now because I, I don't want it to blend in. Since this is such a dark color, I know I'm going to lose my pencil work. I'm not quite ready to lose all of it yet. And then, so there's a gap here, and then I'm going to add in another band of dark fur here. And I'm just going to bring my camera down just a little bit, because now that we're getting into more detail, I want you to be able to see it a little more clearly. And so what I'm doing is kind of almost using hatch marks to fill this in because I want it to look like it has a furry texture to it. 
but I'm also trying to take care around my my lines. But the thing that I mentioned earlier is that since this isn't my original sketch, if I feel like I'm losing some of the detail, I always have my drawing to refer back to. So if I can't quite remember how I drew something the first time, then I can very easily go in and just refer to my original drawing. So all is not lost. And then I decided I wanted to have the dark ears. So I'm going to go in and fill that in dark too. And I'm leaving the edges a little bit ragged again with just using sort of quick, short brush strokes that mimic fur. And again, just use method of blending it out. While that's drying, I'm going to go in and fill in his paws. And I'm kind of losing my line work, but it's okay because I'll go in and define that later. Shoes. And I didn't give a color to the lamp. I was kind of thinking that it might be a porcelain lamp. That's a like a white porcelain lamp, something like that. But you're welcome to add in something if you feel so inclined to do so. Okay. And then you know, the, the rest of the face has had a little time to dry. Go in and fill in the nose. And I'm kind of creating like a C shape. I fill it in so that I can have that highlight. Now we have it mostly filled in um, and we are pretty much most of the way complete with this, with getting the colors in. You can definitely add in uh, if you want to create a little bit more um, depth with the colors, you can add more layers, you can add a little bit more shadow if you want it to be a little bit more intense. Um, I'm gonna let this one dry a little bit more just because the paper is still soft and damp. Um, so I don't wanna start adding line work to it just yet. I wanna let it dry more. So I'm gonna set this one aside. And for the rest of this uh, painting, I'm gonna go in and start to just add some outlines you can decide how you want to outline this. I'm going to be using a pen. This is going to create a really bold outline. Um, so it's going to be really uh, strong. But you could also do, uh, if you have colored pencil, you could 
use colored pencil to maybe get a softer outline. Or if you have uh, different colored pens, you might choose to use a brown um, or a sienna color that would be a little less uh, bold, but it would still create a nice outline so that you could see some of those details. So I'm just gonna go through and start giving some outline. I'm gonna start with the face and then uh, I'll sort of pick and choose. I might not outline everything because I might not want everything to have a really crisp outline. Um, I'll just kind of work intuitively. You can do the same, whatever you think works best for your painting. I may have grabbed one there. Okay, it does have ink. I thought I grabbed one that didn't have any ink in it. Hello, Amelia, jumping in here. Hello. Oh my God, look at his little face. Yeah, now you can start to see the little little details. He's so cute. Um, We have about 10 minutes left. Okay. Um, I am curious if anybody else um, on the live wants to share. Yeah, definitely. I would love to see where people are if you're doing a badger, if you picked to do something else. Um, so if you want to share, feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself. There's not many on the live today. Ooh, ooh, ooh okay. Um, Jenny, feel free to unmute yourself. I'm going to spotlight you. Oh my goodness. So cute. That looks great. So did you outline yours first or did you print it onto the paper and then draw it or did you use pen? I outlined it first. Great. It looks beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Love it. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, Eva, if you feel like sharing, absolutely no pressure if you don't want to. Um, but yeah, we've got about, oh, ooh, ooh, yes, she turned her camera on. Okay, I'm gonna spotlight you. Wow, that's so cute. Oh, I love that you did a red lamp. I like the red and the green together. They look really nice. You're still on mute. So yeah, sorry, I was like, and I couldn't find my mute button. Yeah, I just, I was in a very green and red and gold. Mood. I love it. So. Oh, I like that you did the pattern with the um the opposite that I did with the dark uh over the eyes. I think that's how they're actually colored. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't, but then I was like, you know what? I'm probably gonna end up covering it anyway with eyeglasses. So yeah, it turned out okay. <laughs> it looks really nice. Did you use a gold with the? the yeah. I like that. Yeah. Thanks. Great, we do, both did a wonderful job. Thank you for sharing. All right, so let's uh, take the last 10 minutes to get some more work in. I will spotlight you again, Amelia. Thanks. Thank you for sharing, Eva. Yeah, beautiful job, both of you. It's so cute. It's so fun to see how um, people choose to sort of do their own version of things. And I love seeing that. So I think it turned out really, really great. So yeah, this is this is kind of different for me because I usually did what, what both of you did where I outlined it, where I outline it first and then fill it in. So it's kind of a, a new technique for me to try where I do the, the paint first and then fill it, fill in the line work later. So it's kind of fun to try something new. But I do find that um, because I rely so much on line work, it's definitely challenging because then I, I'm like, eh, I don't wanna lose my where I have my lines. Um, so it definitely makes it a little 
little harder than what I'm used to, but I like, I like trying new things with art. I do have to say I love a nice bold outline on something. I think it just really makes it pop. If you want to, if you want to put something on the book, like a little drawing or squiggles that look like words, or if you want to write a title, you can do that too. Um, that's always fun. I like to think of, about clever titles for books, about what what might a badger be reading about. Admittedly, I, I don't actually know very much about badgers. I, I always was kind of an animal geek when I was a kid. I really loved learning about animals, but I just never really uh, learned much about badgers. So if you know any fun badger facts, uh, you could think about what type of book they might be reading. I don't know what they eat. They eat bugs. Maybe it's a cookbook about how to prepare bugs or whatever it is they eat. Uh, or maybe he's uh, reading up on den building skills or something, home improvement. <laughs> I don't know. But I definitely really loved when I was a kid reading um, books about animals like uh, Wind in the Willows or the Beatrix Potter books. I really loved the idea of animals having their own little outfits and houses. Yeah, that's so cute. So that's something that comes up in my work a lot. It's such a adorable thing to think about. If you're trying the, the technique that I'm trying at any point um, and you find that it's hard to perfectly match your original outlines, I think that's okay. I have a spot here where I kind of misaligned the line work with the paint. I think that's all right. Um, there's something cool that happens with screen printing or it's called risograph printing, which is like a special type of printer where sometimes the color isn't quite aligned. There's like a misalignment between the color and the outline. That's kind of, um, I think it looks charming. Uh, and I've noticed that a lot of artists will actually try to purposefully recreate that. So I like to think of it where if I kind of misalign my line work and my color, it's like misregistration. Um, and I think it looks pretty neat. So don't fret if you're trying this and you find that you're having a hard time matching up your line work perfectly. It's actually kind of a cool thing. I lost control a little bit. <laughs> Accidentally went a little further. See, that's what I get for talking about it. <laughs> I think it looks okay though. I'm not too worried about it. Especially because I have at least two other copies of this, so 
lots of chances to draw it again. That's the thing I keep reminding myself is that there's no limit on how many times you can do a drawing. So it's not really possible to totally mess it up forever. You just do it again. And you learn something from each time that things don't go quite as planned. You know, it works out. Kind of using a little bit of a broken line around the lamp. So it looks like it's a little lighter. Sorry to cover it up totally with my hands. I was holding it flat. I let the pen kind of skip over everything. We can even add in a little more detail after if you want. I'm adding some little patch marks for texture. Hey, Amelia, we are technically at time, but um, I want to know if you want to like finish up anything um, before the live stream ends. I know you're doing details now. Oh, and did you just sign your piece? I did just sign it. Yes. <laughs> An important thing that I always forget to do. <laughs> so, so cute. Thanks. I don't have anything else other than the very satisfying tape removal. So if anyone wants to stick around for that, otherwise I'm pretty much wrapped up. I would say just do the tape removal because I love the tape removal. I love that's a nice. washy peel. Yes, that's always the best. Let me unstick it because I folded it across the back. Do that first. All right. And I love the details on the sweater that you did. Thank you. Oh yeah, now you can see the wash so much better. Yes, yeah, that's one of my favorite parts is, especially if you're doing a very light wash, it shows up so nicely mm -hmm. against the weight of the paper. Oops. Thank you. Rip a little bit of the paper. That yeah, happens. Yeah. And there we go. So cute. The colors are so rich and it's it's really nice. Thanks. Yeah. The, you can get some really beautiful colors and mixtures from this palette. It's a really nice one. I love it. Yeah. It, the glow is so cool. I love yeah. seeing that. Very cozy. Yeah. Super cozy. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was really, really like relaxing to watch. <laughs> Great. Thanks. I'm glad. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you for those who joined us live. Um, again, this is recorded and will be posted probably tomorrow um, on the Watercolor Sacks Mix Group. Um, and Amelia, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Of course. You're welcome. Thanks to everybody else for joining. I appreciate it. And please take a photo of your work and post it on Mix. We want to see the final piece. I would love to see. Awesome. All right. Have a good day. See ya. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.